We're here at the Broadcom booth again to see the future of uh, proximity detection. How, how can we uh, see where you are in a store or a museum? And that's who I'm going to meet right now. My name is Sean Wuhl, I'm the CEO of Omni Trail Technologies. Very cool. And who are you? I am Nias Khan, I'm the lead engineer at Omni Trail. Very cool. And what are we seeing here? What, what are you guys uh, demonstrating? Sure. So we've been working with a few marquee partners of ours, uh, Broadcom uh, and Verizon, to develop a solution that allows passive presence detection to take place even under very uh, 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 onerous circumstances. So as, as of today, micro-location and, and sort of background processing requires that the, the phone is reading the signals coming in from the ambient environment, whether it's the access points around it, whether it's a Bluetooth beacon, any sort of uh, location input that it can receive coming into the handset. What we've done is actually flip that RF interface architecture on its head. So we're actually emitting a very low power beacon using Broadcom's uh, deep sleep state connectivity solutions. And uh, even if the Wi-Fi settings on your phone... Now where's the speaking? Is that on a... a, in a it's in your cell phone. It's in my cell phone. It's in your cell phone. Okay. So, so the architecture is completely flipped. Instead of the cell phone looking for the needle in the haystack, we're actually shooting out a beacon that allows us to identify the device and almost disrupt next to no power. So in a 24-hour period, our uh, solution uh, actually uses less than 2% of your battery uh, over, over the course of a 24-hour 20 uh, period uh, uh, charge. So when I walk into a museum or something like that, and what is going to have to be in the museum for this to work? So what does the museum have to, have to put in the infrastructure? Or does it use existing Wi-Fi radios? So for example, uh, with our carrier partners, one of the things we've developed is a, is a model where they're actually going out there and managing the Wi-Fi networks for large venues, retailers, uh, Starbucks. stadiums, Starbucks, exactly. And so they can actually put this on their phones. It's a small Android patch that we've developed for now. It can work on any operating system. So it can work on any OEM. And uh, it's, it's a pass that's delivered as a photo, a firmware over the air upgrade by the carrier in market devices. It doesn't have to be a, a new chip. It can actually go and, and we work with the, the most popular uh, Broadcom Wi Fi chips out there. They can put this uh, over the air onto their phones. They can put our software onto the access points that they're managing on behalf of retailers. And now all of a sudden you have an end to end capability that allows you to be located within 1.5 meters of granularity. So I don't need to upgrade if I run a museum. I don't need to change the Wi Fi that's right. infrastructure. I don't have to change the radio. That's or, right. That's exactly. I just update, I, I run an update. Yeah. It's a remote yeah. software update. So today, if you think about how Wi-Fi works in the receiving end, it's actually looking for packet headers that are marked with special Wi-Fi packet headers saying, hey, this is a Wi-Fi packet. It's floating through 2.4, it's floating through 5 gigahertz. Don't throw it away because it's a Wi-Fi packet. Our software update on the Wi-Fi access point side basically says, hey, look out for these Omnitrail headers. They're not exactly Wi-Fi packets, but you should accept them anyway. You should forward them to our database. To, we, we include a URL and forward those packets onto our database. We say, oh, we've identified this user, we've identified Andrew Samuel, he's walking inside of a target, and then we can forward the permission sets associated with that device onto the third parties that can then take advantage of the technology. How accurate is this? Is it inches or feet or yards? So as of today, just using our core beaconing technology, we're down to a meter and a half of granularity. Okay, so about, about this much, right? That's right. And so uh, we'll actually demonstrate that for you shortly. Uh, and what we're doing as a roadmap feature is integrating with other location inputs. So Broadcom has a very terrific uh, HUA uh, engine, which is the hybrid universal location algorithm. It takes inputs from all the different sensors, cell ID, GPS, Wi-Fi, accelerometer, barometer, gyroscope, and you actually get, you can get real sort of uh, sub one meter levels of granularity. And right now, one of the heftiest parts from a battery uh, uh, consumption standpoint is the Wi-Fi part of that, uh, of, of that algorithm. So if you replace the Wi-Fi part, the Wi-Fi part the algorithm with our beacons, for example, is on the same Wi-Fi chip, on the same Wi-Fi infrastructure, you get all the benefits of a technology that is offloading that processing power to the AC power guys that are plugged into the wall, the access points, while taking advantage of all the sensors on the actual mobile device to get you real granularity, Wi-Fi settings, again, you can have that thing turn on, you can turn on, attention management, it doesn't interfere with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. If this is all done in software, basically, right? Yes. Uh, it doesn't cost a lot of money. You're not going to put something new into the hardware in my phone. We've only been successful in spending money. <laughs> That's a problem for this guy. Right? <laughs>
So our provisioning costs, we've been working with Verizon, they've been a terrific partner. We've realized that if you can actually develop a location service that developers want to use, that is privacy sensitive, that doesn't interfere with all the other things that are out there today in the market, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all the different uh, things that you want to use 2.4 and 5 gigahertz for, then developers may actually want to pay for that. Retailers may want to pay for that, right? So we have no provisioning costs, there's no bomb increase, right? Uh, unless uh, Henry would like to tell us, no. oh, okay, well, we're not going to charge you. <laughs> but uh, if carriers have no uh, no provisioning costs, we thought, you know what, this is a new, the, the ecosystem, the application layer now is just driving so much of the value, yeah. right? It made sense for, you know, back in the day, for if you owned a protocol, you know, maybe you wanted to charge the carriers and the OEMs and the other chip manufacturers to, to, to provision the technology. Is there an advantage that. to using this technology along with a low end or a smart Bluetooth beacon? Uh, like an IB, well, it's an IB beacon's on Apple, but like the uh, beacons you guys have shown me, it's not even shown me. There is. There absolutely is. So we don't see ourselves actually directly competitive with Bluetooth or BLE. We look at the proximity universe as something that's going to be really a trillion dollar market across every, everything's going to change in proximity, right? And so, you know, in certain scenarios where you have a Bluetooth beacon and a mom pop store, for example, if they just want the simplicity of putting a Bluetooth beacon there, makes sense. That'll interact with your phone, no problems. Your Bluetooth is turned on, terrific. Wearables, if you want to have some sort of safety capability between your wearable device and your, and your smartphone, that makes a lot of sense. We share the onboard memory that Bluetooth and Wi Fi actually uses on Broadcom's connectivity chips. But if you're looking at a situation where you have a large venue, an airport, a museum, a stadium, right, and you want uh, something that uh, you don't have to put Bluetooth beacons on, for example, in that situation, you can put our software on that on those access points, and this will work in a much more robust way. And this is a meter and a half accuracy. So if you're uh, in a museum and you just want to know that I'm standing in front of the uh, Monet, for instance, so you can tell my phone about that Monet, you don't have to be all that accurate about it. Low energy Bluetooth, you could be inches away and, and know that I'm there. So for a payment system, to the cash register or something like that, you probably need to use two different. Systems, right? You so need to use, it's just knowing you, you're standing there is one thing, but knowing your phone is right on the desk is another thing. So you might need an NFC or a low energy. So NFC is a great example of something that can actually bridge the gap for something that our technology in particular can actually bring it, because the requires it operates in 13.56, so you have to be literally centimeters away for NFC to be detected. But if you think about Bluetooth today, the developer recommendations for Bluetooth today is to not pull more than once every 10 seconds. So if you're not pulling more than once every 10 seconds, you're just not going to get the kind of resolution that you can So really, BLE today, and the way it's being architected with battery constraints around it, because it's listening for beacons coming into the handset, it's just, it's just it's just not as good as, as our Wi-Fi, as our Wi-Fi based, uh, Mac-Fi based uh, solution. But the, the other thing that I'll say about that though is you also have to look at the air architecture of Bluetooth. It is looking for signals coming into the handset. One of the problems with Wi-Fi microlocation has been that it's been so successful. There's so many Wi-Fi devices out there emitting their signals that the whole device looking for all these signals reading in is actually having trouble parsing through all these signals coming in. So it's actually been the success of Wi-Fi that has actually made microlocation so difficult. So you flip it on its head, you can kind of do the demo. So can we see it yeah. real fast? Sure. Yeah. What, uh, what it does? So we have uh, this integrated into Samsung Galaxy S3. Uh, if you go into the settings functionality, you now see separate off each other functionality. And if you turn on beaconing, what you'll notice here is a detection happens. So this is simulating something that can happen with a gaming console. <coughs> so uh, you walk in, it detects that you've come into the uh, uh, living room, and it says, hey, your, new, your friend's game library is now available on your Xbox. We've set the uh, uh, proximity detection to be very sensitive. So if I were to walk away, what you'll notice is that it will go back to the normal selection that was showing me. I come back in, it triggers again right away. So the proximity detection can be configured to be something like, you know. So this is minority report. <laughs> I'm going to walk around the store and all exactly. these games are going to go bing, bing, bing. Hi, exactly. Robert Scoble. It's not minority report. It's welcome Robert Scoble, right? To the Amishill demo report. That's what. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. But it, this, is, this is the it's future cool context because a store, I'm talking to a lot of retailers, they want to know where you are in the store where you went by, you know, did you go to the cookie aisle before going to the milk, or did you go to the milk first and then... You're talking to a lot of retailers? Yeah. Well, my name's Sean, by the way. Yeah, yeah. how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, because uh, Macy's is putting uh, technologies like this in, uh, yeah, a lot of people are, right? Because it, it's real important to know where the customer is in the store and build a smart experience so that I can put coupons on your phone and do all sorts of things. And, and we thought one of the cool ways of kind of approaching that was, was with the solution they already need. So Wi-Fi is already very mandatory for things like 
guest access, staff access. So if you, you, can, you can use in-market hardware to sort of overlay a solution that will solve for all these things, they don't need to think about new installations, new site surveying, all that kind of stuff. It gets, it gets a little bit difficult. So, so uh, this is the kind of thing that we're seeing from the uh, Broadcom booth, uh, Broadcom here at Consumer Electronics Store. This is what, your 21st year in business? 22nd. 22nd year. <laughs> what was it like starting this company? How did, it, how did, Broadcom, how did you start well, this the in our Silicon Valley company was two or three people, so yeah. when we started, it was literally two of us. So it's remarkable we've gone from two people to 13,000 20 years we've been in existence. But it's all about innovation, and that's, that's what's exciting about the show, is just showing off what the future holds for uh, communications technology. Just one last thing, I, how do you keep it? Because, you know, I, I worked at Microsoft and they slowed down, you know, uh, in the last six years. What have they really uh, brought out to the market? You know, a couple products, but not for many thousand people. They, they definitely slowed down. How do you keep an organization that size innovative so that you have each step you've got to well, You've got to keep refreshing smart people into the company. We're, we're acquiring lots of startups. You see bright guys here at startups. You bring them into the company, they bring new technology, and you hire smart people, and they just come up with new ideas. Working very closely with innovative customers. You know, you've got the Apples, the Samsungs of the world, who are driving you to uh, the next generation of technology and looking for new ideas. So close collaboration with them helps a lot as well. So you mix smart people together with smart customers, and good things happen. <laughs> Thank you so much for a little bit of time, a Pleasure. little bit of a tour of your of, uh, experience here, because not every journalist gets to come, come in here, so I Good. appreciate that very Happy much. Happy to do it. Thanks. Thanks.